Hello and welcome to Zarina Speaks and today we're going to cover the last two chapters of the BMF which is chapters 15 and 16 anesthesia and emergency treatment of poisons. So you're getting a two for one deal in this video. Um, anesthesia is a very short chapter so we're going to look at the two main types of anesthetics and different examples of those and with regards to emergency treatment of poisons we'll look at what different products medicines you can be poisoned with and the antidotes with them and we'll cover the main ones. So anaesthetics. So the two main types are IV and inhalation. You can also use topical anaesthetics at, at an injection site um, to help reduce pain and smaller doses of anaesthetics can be used in patients who are ill, in shock, debilitated or have significant hepatic impairment. So let's start off with IV anaesthetics. So IV can be used to either induce anaesthesia or to maintain it throughout surgery. Now you have something called total IV anaesthesia and this is, this, um, is used in major surgery when all medicines or drugs would be given via the IV route. So some examples of IV anaesthetics include propofol. Prof propofol is the mostly used um, anaesthetic it has rapid recovery and less hangover effect. Some side effects though include bradycardia, in which case you might need to give an antimuscarinic IV, and also um, extraneous muscle movements. So you might need to give an opioid analgesic or a benzodiazepine. Another example is thiopental sodium. This is a barbiturate and it's associated with more sedative effects and this can persist for 24 hours. There's also etomidate. Etomidate has a rapid recovery without a hangover effect. Not having a hangover, always a good thing. Um, and it's associated with less hypotension than propofol and thiopental sodium. And there's also ketamine. Ketamine is rarely used, but it can be used in paediatric cases. It has a high incidence though of hallucinations and nightmares. So benzodiazepines such as diazepam might also need to be given. So in terms of inhalation, we can inhale gases and volatile liquids. Now, in order to prevent hypoxia, the gas mixture that's being inspired by the patient needs to have a minimum of 25% of oxygen. Now, examples include isoflurane. This is a volatile liquid anaesthetic. Um, it allows a stable heart rhythm due, um, when the isoflurane is given. So that's a good thing. Um, we like a stable heart rhythm. And um, it can be used, an example, in obstrix. There's also sevoflurane, which is more rapid acting, and nitrous oxide. And nitrous oxide, again, it can be used in obstrix. It can be used when you're changing um, painful wound dressings, in post-operative physiotherapy, and in ambulances. Now, a potential complication, but a condition that is very rare, is something called malignant hypothermia. And in these cases, a patient will get a really high temperature, muscle rigidity, tachycardia, and acidosis. And the treatment option in this would be dantrolene sodium. Now, the healthcare practitioners and the anaesthetists that are treating a patient, it's really important that they know exactly what medication that patient is taking, because in some cases, it'll be really important to stop some of their normal medicines, whereas in other cases, it wouldn't be necessary for them to stop the medicines, they should be taking it. So examples that medication that should be continued even if they're going to have surgery and that shouldn't be stopped are, for example, anxiolytics, antipsychotics, antithyroid, thyroid medication. Whereas drugs that should be stopped before surgery include oral contraceptives, lithium, which should be stopped 24 hours beforehand, your monoamine oxidase inhibitors, your mouths, because they interact with a lot of things, with a lot of medication, um, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin 2 receptor antagonists, um, because they'll be associated with hypotension and any herbal products. If a patient is on an anticoagulant or an antiplatelet, it needs to be decided whether or not that patient's anticoagulant or antiplatelet is stopped or it's replaced with an unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. 
And in terms of dental procedures, um, sedation you sh is limited to conscious sedation. So something like diazepam, temazepam, they are effective anxiolytics in patients that are going to undergo um, dental procedures. In terms of anesthesia juvens, we could give, for example, drugs that affect the gastric pH. So regurgitation, aspiration of the gastric contents, these are complications usually in general anesthesia. So we can give something like a H2 receptor antagonist because this will increase the pH and decrease the volume of the gastric fluid. And we can give this orally one to two hours before the person has their procedure. We might also need to give the patient a sedative such as a benzodiazepine if they're experiencing any fear or anxiety prior to their procedure. And in terms of respiratory depression, Respiratory depression is a complication associated in patients that are taking opioid analgesics. So we might need to give them um, artificial ventilation or treatment, treat them with naloxone if respiratory depression does occur. So in terms of neuromuscular blocking drugs, otherwise known as muscle relaxants, now these muscle relaxants aren't the same ones that are used in, say, muscular skeletal disorders. These ones are used in an example um, if you need to put a tube down a patient's trachea. You want to relax their vocal cords, their diaphragm, their abdomen, in order for that tube to go down more easily. So an example of a drug that you can use is succimethonium chloride. This is a fast onset and a brief duration of action, which makes it really effective in being able to be used for tracheal intubation. And we mentioned earlier about local anaesthetics being used, and for example, at the site of injection. And examples of these are your canes, so lidocaine, tetracaine, Prilocaine, those are all examples. That was anaesthesia in a nutshell, and now we'll move on to the emergency treatment of poisons. And there's two main sources when it comes to poisons and information that we can gather from them. So that's Toxbase and the UK National Poisoning Information Service. So if a patient has been poisoned, um, I say they've collapsed in our pharmacy, there's certain things that we can do to help assist them. So we need to look at their respiration. Are their airways open? If they're not, and if it's safe to do so, you need to lift their chin or their jaw, and you might even need to give them assisted ventilation, such as mouth to mouth. We'll need to look at their blood pressure. If their systolic blood pressure falls below 70, that can cause irreversible brain damage. So if a person does collapse, if this is the person, this is their head, these are their legs, make sure their legs are raised so then all that blood flow can go back down to the head. We might also need to give them, um, administer them with sodium chloride infusion. If they're getting frequent convulsions, might need to, they might need to be given IV lorazepam or diazepam. In terms of their body temperature, we need to check if, that, if they have hypothermia or hyperthermia. If they have hypothermia, this... Um, can be caused, for example, with poisoning of barbiturates, um, and typically if they've been unconscious for several hours. In terms of hyperthermia, this can be caused by taking CNS stimulants, and the um, children and the elderly are particularly at risk if they're taking, for example, medication that has antimuscarinic properties. So if they are experiencing hyperthermia, if they have hyperthermia, then we need to remove any unnecessary clothing, fan them down and um, put a sponge with water on them, so with tepid water, to promote evaporation. So we'll need to look at their heart rate. If they have any arrhythmias or cardiac conduction defects, this can happen typically with um, poisoning with tricyclic antidepressants, antipsychotics or antihistamines. So questions with regards to this topic will mostly relate to the examiners giving you um, a situation where a patient has had an overdose of a drug and then you working out which antidote would be best suited for them. So for example, we can give activated charcoal. The way that this works is that it binds to the poisons in the GI system, so it reduces absorption. It can be used for carbamazepine, theophylline, quinine, phenobarbital, and we might need to give repeated doses of activated charcoal by mouth. Um, if a person experiences vomiting, give them an antiemetic. But activated charcoal can't be used for everything. And in cases where it can't be used are, for example, in alcohol poisoning, poisoning with cyanides or metal salts such as iron or lithium. 
We could do hemodialysis. Hemodialysis can work with or lithium and sodium valproate, phenobarbital, or we might need alkalinization of urine with salicylates or sulfasalazine. There's also gastric lavage. Um, gastric lavage is rarely used, but it can be used in situations when the poison has been ingested an hour beforehand and it's not a substance that can be absorbed by charcoal. For example, we can use it in cases of iron or lithium poisoning. Whole bowel irrigation might be needed for enteric coated or modified release preparations. Now let's look at some specific drugs and what we can do um, or what antidotes are given to help treat their poisoning. So in terms of alcohol, alcohol poisoning symptoms include drowsiness, which could lead to a coma. You could also get acidosis, hypotension, ataxia. And what would be really important in the case of alcohol poisoning is making sure that the airways are clear, because if a person then starts vomiting, they could then end up choking on their own vomit. You'd also need to measure their blood glucose to make sure that they don't become hypoglycemic. In terms of aspirin, um, symptoms of aspirin poisoning include hyperventilation, um, deafness, vasodilation. So we could give activated charcoal, particularly if it's been within one hour of ingesting the aspirin. But in really severe cases, we might need to resort to hemodialysis. In terms of opioids um, and opioid poisoning, symptoms include pinpoint pupils. So your pupils look like two little dots. Um, also coma, respiratory depression, and the antidote that's given is naloxone. With paracetamol, the early signs and symptoms of overdose include nausea and vomiting, but a few days later, three to four days later, can actually get liver damage, hemorrhage, um, hypoglycemia, and even death. So with paracetamol, there's actually quite a delayed response um, in terms of the signs and symptoms of toxicity. Now, Questions regarding paracetamol toxicity could actually be in the maths paper, because if you look in the BNFs, there's a graph and the graph shows how much time has elapsed in hours and what the patient's paracetamol plasma, plasma paracetamol concentration is. And there's a treatment line. And if the value falls on the treatment line or above the treatment line, then they need to be treated with acetylcysteine. And this is given in three infusions. And the way that you work out the infusions and the dose that is given is based on the patient's weight in kilograms. So there's a lot of numbers involved. So they could potentially put that in the math section. In terms of tricyclic antidepressants, um, signs and symptoms include a dry mouth, a hypotension, even coma, and dilated pupils. So remember with opioids, it'll be pinpoint pupils. With tricyclic antidepressants, it'd be dilated pupils. And again, questions could give you a scenario where a patient comes into your pharmacy, they have X, Y and Z symptoms. What have they been overdosed with or what poison is running through their body right now? So it's the key words again. So pinpoint pupils would be your opioids, dilated pupils would be your antidepressants. In terms of SSRIs, um, Signs and symptoms of toxicity include nausea and vomiting, drowsiness, tremor, and in very rare and severe cases, signs and symptoms of serotonin syndrome. With both the tricyclic antidepressants and SSRIs, if they've been ingested within the last hour and then they gain toxicity, or well, if they've ingested it within the last hour and it's been no dose, then we can give them activated charcoal. Um, if they experience any convulsions, we can give them IV lorazepam or diazepam. Antipsychotics and benzodiazepines give activated charcoal in, within one hour of overdose. Um, in terms of beta blockers, just think about what beta blockers do. So they're there to slow down the heart rate. They're there to reduce your blood pressure. So if you overdose in them, you're going to get lightheaded, you're going to get dizzy, hypotension. So what we need to give is IV atropine for bradycardia with IV glucagon in glucose 5%. In terms of calcium channel blockers, such as verapamil, signs and symptoms would include nausea and vomiting, dizziness, confusion. And again, if it's been ingested in the last hour, we could give activated charcoal. But think about it, calcium channel blockers, essentially they're blocking calcium. So what can we give? 
we could give them calcium in the form of calcium chloride or calcium gluconate in patients that have are experiencing severe signs and symptoms. In terms of iron overdose, signs and symptoms include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, rectal bleeding, and the antidote for this would be desferioxamine. Remember that name, um, even though it's not the nicest names to remember, but I think I have seen that in questions beforehand. So remember, iron, you need to give chelate iron, some of that chelate iron, and that an example of that is desferoxamine. Now, in terms of lithium, if the plasma concentration is above two millimoles per litre, that indicates serious toxicity. So if it's been ingested within an hour, we can do gastric lavage. Um, otherwise, we could do hemodialysis if there are neurological symptoms or any renal um, failure. In terms of overdose with stimulants, in general, you would give diazepam or lorazepam. Um, if it's if a person has been overdosed with cocaine, they might have dilated pupils, hallucinations. Whereas if it's ecstasy, otherwise known as MDMA, it would be a patient's signs and symptoms would be um, convulsions, coma or delirium. So with toxicity with theophylin, um, usually because it's given by modified release preparations, the effects of toxicity are delayed, but a patient can experience dilated pupils, hyperglycemia, restlessness, vomiting, and you would give repeated doses of activated charcoal even if more than an hour has elapsed since the overdose of theophylline has occurred. In terms of carbon monoxide poisoning, so there's a lack of oxygen, so you would give oxygen. You'd give a high flow of 100% of oxygen to the patient. So in terms of cyanide toxicity, um, the antidote for this would be dicobalt editate. Now this is a prescription only medicine, but this restriction doesn't apply when it comes to saving life in an emergency situation. In terms of snake bites and insect stings, um, local reactions that a person might experience are pain, swelling, bruising, um, whereas systemically they might end up getting an anaphylactic reaction, so we need to administer adrenaline. So it's worth mentioning that at the back of the BNF, there are some glossy pages, and some of these include medical emergencies in the community. Now it's worth looking at these, familiarising yourself with these, because it is a section that they do like to ask questions on. Um, but also we need to look at the bigger picture. If someone comes in and they're experiencing an asthma attack, anaphylaxis, hypoglycemic attack, you need to know what to do and what to give in those situations. So make sure to go through and have a look at that section. And that's our last two sections done. So the next video is going to focus on guidance of prescribing. So these are actually the first few little sections at the beginning of the BNF. Um, but chapters wise, well done everyone. We've completed um, all the chapters 1 to 16. So give yourself a big pat on the back um, because it's not easy. And um, just remember, it's a case where you have to keep familiarising yourself with the content over and over again. And the biggest advice that I can give is try and practice and utilise that knowledge, knowledge whilst you're working. Whenever you get a medicine, try and think, what is this indicated for? What side effects are associated with it? what maybe major counselling or monitoring points are associated with it because that will make your revision so much more efficient um, and it will help you pick up the information a lot quicker as well. So I hope you found this video useful. If you did, give it a like, give it a thumbs up, um, subscribe, share and join our Facebook page for all the latest information www.facebook.com slash Serena Speaks and until next time, happy revisings.